Oh, um, good afternoon. I haven't rehearsed this video as much, so it's going to be a bit rough at the edges. We're going to think about three things today. Uh, the first is called meiosis, the second is called linkage, and the third is called recombination. Uh, they're three extremely important concepts, and you will need to do further reading to understand them properly. Don't expect to watch this video and walk away completely understanding them all. We'll, um, we'll start with the two questions that we had left hanging at the end of the last lecture. And those questions are, first of all, the pattern of chromosome segregation and allele segregation in mitosis does not match the pattern of allele segregation required by Mendel's principle of segregation. So the, uh, the physical mechanism that we know about does not uh, agree with what Mendel predicted. And the second problem we had was we know there are more genes than there are chromosomes, so that must mean that there is some complication to Mendel's principle of independent assortment, <coughs> because there are, there are um, some genes will be on the same chromosome. And we're going to look at today how those two problems are uh, were solved. We'll start with the first one. The problems between uh, mitosis not uh, not giving the pattern of chromosome segregation. The um, what we really want is some mechanism that will allow the separation of alleles. So the alleles on two homologous each of two homologous chromosomes to be separated. And when Mendel's work was rediscovered in well, around about 1900, geneticists turned to look back at the work that cytologists had done, and they found that there was, in fact, a mechanism that had been discovered that provided chromosome separation of the sort that Mendel needed. And this um, second method of uh, cell division had been discovered by a chap called Edward van Beneden, who is on your screens now, a couple of years after Fleming discovered mitosis, the second method of cell division became called meiosis and um, differs from mitosis in three main ways. First is that it happens in germ cells. Meiosis happens in germ cells, mitosis happens in somatic cells. And this is perfect, of course, because Mendel wanted something that generated or that segregated alleles into gametes. And germ cells, are the, that is the um, uh, cells that give rise to sperm and eggs, germ cells are the cells that generate gametes. So that, that, that fits beautifully. The second thing about meiosis is that it isn't actually just one cell division. It's two cell divisions, one after the other. The first is called meiosis one, the second is called meiosis two. Um, we'll just go into slightly more detail on that now. If you look at the screen and imagine a, um, a pair of homologous chromosomes, we'll call them capital A and lowercase a. We'll replicate those in S space. We've now got two homologous chromosomes, each consisting of two sister chromatids. Those four genetic or DNA units can be separated in two different ways. We can either separate sister chromatid from sister chromatid and that is what happens in mitosis so that into each daughter cell goes a um, complete set of the alleles that are present in the parent. So a diploid parent cell replicates to a diploid but uh, 4C parent cell. Sister chromatids are separated and the daughter cells are both diploid. They have the same amount of genetic information as the parent. You can see that on the left of the screen. However, there is another way to separate out those four genetic uh, DNA units. And that is to separate homologous chromosome from homologous chromosome. And that's the vertical division that you see there. That is what happens in meiosis. So it's just a second... A, a, um, the other way of being able to separate those four genetic units. 
And that gives rise to two daughter cells, each of which has a or two sister chromatids in. So each daughter cell is actually haploid because there is only one unit of genetic information, capital A and capital A, on the left-hand daughter cell there. Um, it's the same genetic information, so they're haploid cells, but they have 2C amount of DNA. The, um, and that's what happens in meiosis 1. Homologous chromosomes are separated. The, um, the obvious thing that, that a, a, a daughter cell with that is haploid that has 2C is no use to anybody. So the obvious thing to do is to just divide each daughter cell again, separate the sister chromatids out. And that is exactly what happens in meiosis 2. So at the end of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, you have um, four cells, each of which are haploid. And you have separated out the alleles from each other into gametes, which is exactly what Mendel requires for his principle of segregation. And that's it. That, that is the solution. Meiosis is the mechanism of cell division that explains Mendel's observations. The, the third important thing about meiosis is a phenomenon that happens during meiosis 1. It actually happens during prophase of meiosis 1. And that phenomenon is called a recombination. Recombination actually is a word that describes a number of different things in biology. Um, this particular recombination is called homologous recombination. So if you just Google recombination and um, you wind up with something that doesn't seem to fit what I'm talking about, that's because it's a different type of recombination. So this is homologous recombination. So those are the three big differences between meiosis and mitosis, and I'll just reiterate them. The first is that they happen in different cell types. Meiosis in germ cells, mitosis in somatic cells. The second thing is that meiosis is actually two cell divisions, one after the other, um, so that a parent cell gives four daughter cells in total, each one of which is haploid, whereas mitosis is just one cell division. And the third difference is that meiosis, during prophase of the first meiotic division, meiosis one, meiosis contains this um, process called recombination. Those are the three big differences. Um, we'll leave that there and we'll pick up on what recombination is in a moment. But we'll just turn now to our second problem um, that we started this, this video with. And that is there are more genes than chromosomes. So there must be cases where uh, genes are together on the same chromosome. How does that affect uh, the ratios that Mendel predicted using his principle of independent assortment? Well, let's have a look at an example. If two, um, and, and a lot of this work was done, when people rediscovered Mendel, they uh, didn't want to use plants because plants are boring. So they wanted to use animal models. And the animal model that they developed, and in fact somebody called Thomas Hunt Morgan developed this model, and you can see him now on the screen. Thomas Hunt Morgan used the fruit fly model, and he developed a number of uh, pure breeding fruit fly strains, and then crossed them to see how the various uh, traits segregated in the offspring. So let's now look at a, um, a fruit fly strain. We've got two traits, one is eye color and one is wing length. And there are two alleles for eye color, one of which gives red, uh, the dominant, um, dominant allele gives red eyes, the recessive allele gives white eyes. There are two alleles for wing length, the dominant allele gives normal length wings and the recessive allele gives short wings. If those two gene loci, the eye color and the wing length loci, segregated independently, according to Mendel's principle of independent assortment, you would expect to see in the F2 generation a, um, a ratio of phenotype assortment that followed the 9331 ratio predicted by Mendel for a dihybrid cross. If, on the other hand, the two genes were on the same chromosome, you would expect 
um, that the, the actual unit of assortment is the chromosome rather than the gene. So if they were sat on the same chromosome, then they would never be separated during gamete formation, and they would always be uh, inherited together. So effectively, even though there are two gene loci, there's just one thing being distributed into gametes, and that's the chromosome. So you expect the pattern to follow um, the 3 to 1 ratio predicted by Mendel for a monohybrid cross. And you can see that prediction on the screen now. Now, when Morgan actually did this cross, what he found was that the observed ratio um, of phenotypes followed neither the 9331 from complete independence, nor did it follow the 3 to 1 predicted by complete, uh, complete non-dependence. It actually followed an intermediate ratio, um, which was, I think, 10 to 2 2. That's on the screen now. And the conclusions that Morgan drew from this were that these two genes, the uh, eye color gene and the wing length gene, were on the same chromosome. But they were some distance apart on the same chromosome. And the, um, the well, and one, uh, one allele could cross over onto the other chromosome. And there is Morgan's original picture of how this might happen is now up on the screen. So Morgan, um, and I should, should say that this was actually based on the observation of things called chiasmata, which early microscopists had seen. They'd seen chromosomes um, during meiosis that were tangled up or messed together. There's a picture on your screen. And Morgan knew about these chiasmata, and he hypothesized that maybe these chiasmata were chromosomes getting tangled up and swapping uh, chunks of chromosome. But that would be a physical mechanism for this crossover that Morgan was, was hypothesizing. Now, it turns out, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail here because the uh, you will have this in your linkage lecture. It turns out that Morgan was essentially correct. And what happens is during meiosis, uh, homologous chromosomes pair up and during um, prophase. When they pair up, this is the process also known as um, synapsis. When they pair up, they get tangled and they can, exactly as he predicted, they can exchange bits of chromosome. So the, uh, a chunk of one chromosome can swap with its homologous chunk on the other homologous chromosome. They can exchange material. This immediately explains why uh, you see linkage. Usually, this, this, this process that Morgan called crossover, this crossover process is relatively rare, relatively. Uh, so most of the time alleles are not separated during segregation. But sometimes if crossover happens between two chromosomes, two homologous chromosomes, with different alleles, then the, um, the alleles present on a chromosome can change. The, um, I'll note in passing that this phenomenon of linkage gives rise to um, what's called genetic mapping. The further apart two genes are on a chromosome, the more likely they are to be separated by crossover. There's just a fixed chance that a crossover will happen in a particular distance. If that distance between two gene loci is very small, then it's unlikely they'll be separated and they will tend to be inherited together. If the difference between gene loci is very large, then most of the time when crossover happens, those two gene or two ally alleles will be separated. So the frequency of crossover between two alleles gives an indication of how far apart the alleles are on a gene. And you can do uh, the three-point crosses that are in the notes and also 
which you did during the practical, to work out the order in which genes are found, roughly how far apart genes are found on a chromosome, this thing called genetic mapping. Now, just to finish off, the, the actual physical nature of um, crossing over brings us back to meiosis. Morgan hypothesized that chromosomes were able to exchange information. And we now know this was work done by somebody called Barbara McClintock um, about 20 years after Morgan, 1930s. We now know that um, during meiosis, in fact, homologous pairs of chromosomes do uh, swap genetic material. Uh, this is called, well, Morgan called it, uh, called it crossover. So it's also homologous recombination. The way they do that is by um, is by the pairing up of two homologous chromosomes and then a chromatid, so homologous chromosomes consist of two, you get this in the middle of the screen, consist of two sister chromatids. When homologous chromosomes come close together, uh, the one chromatid on one homologous chromosome can swap with the other chromatid of the other homologous chromosome. So non-sister chromatids are swapping over. And this is done through the formation of something called a holiday junction, which is the name for that tangle that you see down a microscope when non-sister chromatids cross over. There's a picture of a holiday junction up on your screen at the moment. The, that holiday junction can be cut in a couple of ways. If it's cut one way, you get crossover. If it's cut another way, you get restoration of the original DNA sequence, which is important uh, when it comes to DNA repair. So homologous recombination is not just a process that's seen during meiosis or during, um, uh, yeah. The thing I'll finish on is that homologous recombination is massively important during sex because what it does is it creates new combinations of alleles. That may not seem like such a big deal because we have been dealing primarily with Mendelian genetics in which a trait is determined by one allele, by one gene locus. However, we'll see in the next couple of lectures that that is usually not the case. Most traits, most phenotypes, are actually determined by interactions between several different genes. And it therefore becomes critically dependent to the actual phenotype. What combinations of alleles are present on the chromosome? Recombination shuffles the allele combination, and that means it produces variation in the phenotype. Um, and that is, to some extent, the point of sex, producing new combinations of genetic material that natural selection can act upon. So that's, one, that's the reason why I think homologous recombination is the most important concept to take out of this entire module.